You know what's very funny? I actually just did a couple of podcasts yesterday with female creators. She said, yeah, I've never seen someone get into the mind of a woman the way you do. I will impregnate a woman on the first date if she's hitting all my green flags. How the fuck do they know I'm a dom without interacting with me? You might not be the most competent, capable man she's ever been with. She might have been with a guy that's richer than you, taller than you, more jacked than you. But the thing that makes me stand out is the fact that I can give her a sexual experience that will imprint on her psyche. Yeah, but I just, I just love being whipped so much. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to the Mountain Chad channel where I talk about self-improvement, manhood, and courage. And I try to give a more nuanced and optimistic view of life and women. We have an excellent guest here today, Sterling Cooper, the man himself. In my opinion, the number one guy that men should refer to for a better understanding of the female mind. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself a little bit? Well, thank you. That's a very generous introduction. Yeah, so my name is Sterling Cooper. I am a retired adult film star. Uh, did, was in that career for about five-ish years. Prior to that, I also worked as a high-class male companion, so pleasuring wealthy business ladies, uh, you know, after five-star dinners and things like that. Did that for a number of years. And prior to that, I was also in the uh, swingers scene as a bull. You might use that expression. So I've... I've taken this rather eclectic uh, sexual experience and the knowledge I've derived from that about the female mind, uh, just female sexuality and the female body. And now I teach men how to be better in the bedroom for their partner. So that's what I do. Yeah, you absolutely do. And it's not surface level stuff. It's nuanced stuff. It's stuff that I'd imagine that women overwhelmingly agree with. You know, it's very funny. I actually just did a couple of podcasts yesterday with, uh, with female creators. And they, they said something, they, one of them said basically exactly what you said. She said, uh, yeah, I've never seen someone get into the mind of a woman the way you do. And I'm like, well, that's good to hear. <laughs> Straight from the horse's mouth. I'll take that compliment all day. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, you're Australian, right? Correct. Yeah. Australian, born and bred. Been awesome. living in America for like the last five years. Uh, and now I've just recently made a move over to Europe. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Why'd you choose Spain? You know what, uh, the, the particular place I've chosen, I've got a lot of friends here, uh, really, really good friends. They've, they've been living here for a number of years. The network was kind of, I, I've, I visited here last year. I did a boxing camp here last year uh, for a couple of months. So I kind of knew the city a little bit, got a taste of it. And uh, I wanted to be on European soil for a while. And this was just kind of the easiest plug-in option, I guess. Easiest path, to re easy residency option here. Uh, easy visa access, great network of friends already. I understand the city already. It was there was like no learning curve, if that makes sense. Yeah, so for me, absolutely. it was like okay, I can move here and I, I can get keep going, keep straight back into work. Like it's not going to slow anything down. So yeah, that was kind of the, the main reason. And lots of sun, lots of beautiful women, really oh, healthy yes. food. That's that's a plus as well. Oh yeah, I've only been to Spain twice, but it was gorgeous both times. This this city in particular attracts a lot of Swedish and English. Uh, the holiday, like tourists and holiday makers. So gotcha. everyone's, got, everyone's in, got their beach pod and it's, uh, yeah, it's very pleasant. I have yeah. a very, uh, I have a very like warped idea of Australians in my mind because I never knew any growing up, but for some reason, the universe just blesses me with like a group of Australians. Anytime I'm out partying in a new city in <laughs> Tokyo, Shanghai, Las Vegas, they just drop out of thin air, like five Australian guys like, hey, let's drink. I'm like, OK, <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're pretty much everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we, we tend to travel in packs like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah, become like get... a hallmark of a good night. Yeah, but in e it's pretty it's a pretty common character trait of Australians. Yeah, yeah been there, done that. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's jump into this because I got a lot of questions and uh, to some degree, I'm going to be asking for advice a little bit because uh, you're, frankly, you're one of the few men that I think can really answer some of these questions that I've been mulling over for a long time. Cool, cool. So I'm a dom myself and I have a very specific list of what I will and won't do. Can you put me into your state of mind when you are a male escort and you are a porn star and what are the principles that you live by that guided your interactions with your clients and in the, in, in the industry as well? Very good question. You know, what's interesting is that it was actually, it wasn't until I got into pornography that there was a, that I started crossing a few of my previous boundaries, oddly enough, mm -hmm. like things that I wouldn't have done prior. And it was actually working for kink.com of all websites that 
introduced me uh, into how to do certain things like safely and erotically for a woman. Like for, for me, primarily like erotically slapping a woman in the face. Oh yeah. That was for me, that was a complete no, no. I'm like, no way in hell I do that. No way in hell. Uh, I, I thought there's no way in hell a woman could enjoy that either. That was, I had that, that mentality for a long time. And then I got introduced to, I started working for kink.com and one of my, my mentor, basically uh, the director who hired me, he was the guy, I don't know if you're familiar with the, um, the armory in San Francisco. No, I'm so not. If, you, if, you, if, you ever, if anyone ever watches a movie from kink.com, the very, very intro where they show the website, you'll see this kind of castle looking thing. And that's the armory in San Francisco. That's where they used to ha have like all these giant BDSM parties. Uh, and they, they had all had like a whole army of like submissives training up and, and dominance and had top floor parties where everyone would wear like masquerade parties and they'd have su submissives walking around naked serving drinks and stuff. Mind blowing, like revolutionary stuff for like that, the kind of BDSM scene in the day. And uh, they, they sold that a long time ago, but that, that is still very iconic and associated with them. And this guy who was my mentor, he was the guy who kind of, he was like what we would, you'd call the, um, the world creator of that. So imagine like, imagine Disneyland, right? But BDSM and he's Donald Duck. That's kind of how, how, it, how it worked. So yeah, he, he was creating those, he created those worlds. And like mm. the kind of the fantasy around them and the storyline around them and stuff. And he was, he was a professional Dom uh, actually used to be in the army as well. Did you used to be in the army? Okay. I didn't know. I, did, I know it was a random question, but I've noticed that it was a very common theme I've noticed amongst guys who are Doms or at least, or at least even, even professional Doms is a lot of them had been in the military. Interesting. Because, I, I yeah, did consider it. Just, <laughs> and I think someone explained it to me once it's because uh, by being in the army, by being a soldier, you are effectively a submissive. And okay. So you, you've already learned the submissive role by Absolutely. default, by being That's in the military. Point. And so, okay, now you, because by, then by being the dominant, you understand the submissive's mentality and their role and their mannerisms. So it's like, okay, it makes it much easier to be a, an effective yeah. and then consider yeah. it dom. So that was, yeah, I think that was an interesting insight. Yeah, a bit of the yin and yang, right? Yeah. It's like when you when you learn how to dance as a guy. If you learn if you if you start by actually learning the female role in a dance, yeah. you become a better leader in in the dance, like the tango or salsa. Or whatever. And you really have to start out as the as the follower because if, in the beginning you don't know those steps. Yeah, you don't know the steps at all. So anyway, I'm, I'm going on a bit of a tangent here. Sorry, but uh, no worries. Yeah, so that he 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 started introducing me to like different different toy like taught me how to use floggers how to use whips how to use how to how to how to you know where to hit correctly on the face to slap uh improving what improve my choking technique improve my spanking technique uh yeah improve my like hair pulling techniques started i'd le started learning like a little bit of rope bondage off of him as well an amazing mentor mm. and uh yeah so getting into pornography actually opened up a lot of that stuff so prior to that slapping was a massive no-no i'd never really played around with um I never played around with floggers. I never learned how. To, I never had never learned how to use a flogger. I'd done spanking and I'd done uh, rope bondage. That was something I was really into. I quite enjoyed rope bondage, but yeah, prior to that, it was just a, a line I hadn't crossed before. So, I guess guiding principles for me, at least prior to that, when I was like a male escort, it was always like her her pleasure and her comfort is like paramount and comes first above anything anything else in the interaction and in the in the night. So I would always have to, I wouldn't really, I wouldn't really push a boundary with a, with a client, maybe the way I would, I might do that a little bit in a personal relationship. And I don't mean to say I'm pushing boundaries, like I'm overstepping boundaries, but I'm like, like I'm, we're testing the waters, right? We're going from like a yeah. green light to, to see where, where the orange light might be. Not yeah. going all the way to a red light, but we're seeing like, okay, like where are her limits? And we're going to comfortably approach that. I wouldn't even go as far as doing that when it was with a, with a client, because just because of like the lack of intimacy, initial intimacy and understanding of the person. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, it's actually funny you say that because those are some of my hard lines. Uh, I won't hit in the face. Uh, I won't choke with two hands and I won't use an implement to spank because yeah. I 
I, I don't want to leave marks on her. That's something right. that's I'm I'm deeply against. Um, you know what's funny hand, is that that was some of definitely the, enough. <laughs> right? Yeah. Very often. Yeah. <laughs> some of the some of the women I worked with in for, in you know in the in the porn industry were loved having marks. That was that was they were like a pain bunny. They were like they just loved getting hand marks, cane mark. There was one girl who loved getting cane marks all over her thighs and all over her. She, was, she would just show them off the next day. She was so <laughs> proud of them. And it was just like, to me, that, it was my first introduction to that as well. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like seeing all the different types of subs and how they respond to it. Yeah. And there was one girl I worked with and this, this was actually another boundary that, that kind of, that I ended up, my personal boundary that I ended up going over in when I was in porn and this woman would orgasm from being punched in the face. <laughs> now we're not talking orgasm. like, we're not talking like a, like a straight right with the hips. Thro- we're not like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was, it was more something. It was more like this, like on the kind of on the cheekbone a little bit, like literally kind of like I'm doing right now. Like yeah, almost it's like, just like a connection of bone to bone sort of. Yeah. 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 It's more like that. So well, yeah, it definitely wasn't like, I'm not throwing like a Mike Tyson hook to a head or anything like that. <laughs> Let's not yeah. get, get confused. But do it, like, there was a first experience. I, you know, for me, that was a boundary, which is funny because she's the one being the submissive and she's the one receiving the, the, the punishment, you might say. But I'm the one that's uncomfortable and I'm the one that's being tested with my boundaries. Yes. And, and that was a first experience for me. So she, and she, she would literally climax from that, from that alone. No other stimulation, just from that. And she would climax. Wow. She was a she was a very extreme extreme one. Uh, when you're dealing with subs, you meet some extreme people. The yes. the getting smacked, getting smacked, and uh, getting hit in the face and getting peed on are the two things that I say no to most often. Huh. The the piss stuff I st- I've never done, never ever ever. That is from, that is still a personal boundary of mine. I will not. I don't want to. I don't have any interest in pissing on a girl. To birth, to no, it does nothing for me. Just zero for me entirely. Um, yeah. I actually have a, I have a couple of friends who do it, oddly enough, and I don't think they even really enjoy it. They just do it more for like the psychological dynamic in the relationship. To, yeah, like to extreme that sub uh, humiliation kind of thing. Yeah, extreme humiliation. Like she enjoys getting into that kind of subspace. So yeah, it's a very yeah. interesting situation. I totally agree. Yeah, first ten yeah. minutes we're just like straight into all the all really exactly really exactly. All the- <laughs> <laughs> and. The, the way I have the questions written, this actually might be an inappropriate pivot, but <laughs> my first questions are about you. And then after these, we're going to go deeper into uh, psychology, I suppose. This next one, I've heard you, that you say you want a lot of kids. And, uh, yeah. and, and frankly, I'm right there with you. I, I would love to have a couple of wives, a bunch of kids, homestead, uh, simple life. Again, the irony, yeah. I'm a software engineer. And I want to get as far away from technology as possible. Right? Uh, isn't that, isn't so, that ironic? I know, right? My question to you would be, right now, how much, how seriously are you taking the effort of finding these women and vetting mm-hmm. them? And what's your goal? Like, by 40 or something? Yeah. But honestly, man, as, as soon as possible. Oh, yeah, I'm 36 I'd now. That. I'm 36 right now. And I'm like, yeah. the, the, I will impregnate a woman on the first date if she's hitting all my green flags. If okay. you know, if you if, if if she's amenable to that, that's not very yeah. likely. To, I'm not very likely to find <laughs> that. But yeah, for me, I I date with intention now. For the most part, I'm not going to lie. I, I do have a bit of fun here and there. But when I as I'm proactively searching, I am vetting quite hard for my criteria. And my criteria is basically is, is, number one is un- uh, didn't get the COVID vaccine. That's number yeah. one for me. Uh, because uh, ironically enough, that actually ties into like a lot of, there's a lot of alignment with values. They're probably going to be a bit of a conspiracy theorist. They're probably going to be anti-government like, or at least distrusting of government, distrusting of the media. I'm like, excellent. Oh, these, these are green flags for me looking for a partner. Right. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's, so that's, that's kind of the first big one. Uh, ideally a woman, you know, un, under the age of like 25 would be ideal. I, Cause I want to have a lot of kids. We need like a window to make that happen. And Couldn't women more women tend to be a lot, like the first from what I've heard, at least from people who've had uh, kids that women can have a lot of kids. If they, if they have their first kid at a, at a younger age, then their body's like ready. And then they can keep okay. cranking out kids into their thirties. No problem. 
But when a woman has her first kid at 30 or, or more, then they tend to be a lot more complications in that, in yeah. that first child, like, that a C-section, and, and, like a C-section is required and things like that. And I don't personally want to, uh, to, get, to go down that route if I can avoid it, I'd rather like have a yeah. home birth, a natural birth with a midwife. So there's that. Uh, for me, it's important. I actually really want to have kids with women who have, who share like uh, kind of like the same lineage and history that I, I, I share. So I'm, I'm Irish German by ancestry. So I'm currently looking for like, well, English, Irish, yeah, Irish German, English is probably the, the correct way of saying it. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm, current, I'm basically looking for English girls, Irish girls and German girls or Austrian girls. To, uh, to primarily ha- have kids with. I will, but I will also totally branch out to like Eastern European, like Polish and things like that, just because they're, ex- they're extremely good girls. What uh, about Spanish, Italian? Yeah, I mean, I, if I found a good one, I, would, I, I, would, I might accept it. I'm just, it's just so different to my back. Like, the cult, like culturally is kind mm-hmm. of the main reason is because like English, Irish, Australian cultures are like identical. They are basically. very, very similar, yeah. You know, so there's, there's less like, cultural conflict i guess when it comes to like raising the kids and like teaching them values and like little things like just it's just it's i've just seen it play out with this conflict between the, the husband and the, and the wife in terms of like oh well, i'm polish well but i'm english we're gonna do it this way we're gonna do it that way and so that's just something I'd, i would like to avoid personally so there's that uh yeah obviously obviously like thing basic things that, like low body count feminine submissive for me, these are important, um, but those are prerequisites that I you can't really vet for them. You just have to you have to find those out when you're in front of that person, and when you're when you're, when you're interacting with them. Uh, yeah, that's oh yeah, and it's obviously down for a homestead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's it's yeah, interested that's in an like important part. Interested in, so obviously not a girl who's in, who wants all the glitz and glamour. I'm looking for a girl who who and these typically are women who were born in the countryside or raised on farms or and something like that. They're comfortable with the farm life. They're comfortable with getting away from everything. Uh, and again, this ties in with like the, the unvaxxed stuff, like that she's going to be like sick and tired of all the woke stuff. So she's like, you know what? I don't want to live in a big city. Yes, let's get away from it all. Let's be self-sufficient. Uh, healthy is obviously like a you know, good diet and, and exercises. These are, these are obviously tie into all that. Health conscious. Drink. Health yeah, I don't, I don't mind if she drinks, uh, but not like a raging booze head obviously yeah yeah my, my yeah. family's irish and english so i've been around enough uh piss heads <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i mean i i probably do enough drinking for the both of us so she doesn't need to drink at all <laughs> i like that that's kind of exactly actually that's exactly how my parents were my dad did enough drinking for both him and mom and uh, she never drank so it, it worked out the balance seemed to work <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only one in my family who doesn't drink. I, I actually don't have anything against it. It's just not my substance of choice. Yeah. I can drink. Like I'm, I feel like a, I feel like a fat Kenyan guy. I can probably still run. I'm capable of it, but mm. I just don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got the genetics for it. Like it's exactly. in there. <laughs> I got a thousand generations of alcoholism backing up my pursuit. You didn't have, have a pristine liver. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's get into some of the more deep stuff. So an excellent sexual chemistry can be the foundation of a relationship, but can you speak to the dangers of how easily young men can be misled by great sex and find themselves in a toxic situation? I've made that mistake myself a bunch of times. (laughs) Oh yeah. Especially with crazy subs. It's you can get blinded. (sighs) Yeah. Yeah. I think at least for me, understanding what I actually want from a relationship what I actually want from a partner, like having, having a criteria and a plan mm-hmm. has allowed me to avoid that and allow me to step away from that. Whereas when I was a younger guy, just like, you sort of just aimlessly dating and you get with a girl and she's amazing in the sack. And then, okay, you're like, oh, fantastic. Cool. I've got a, I've got a good one. And then the narcissism starts to come out the, 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 the neuroses start to come out, all these bad behaviors and red flags start popping up. And you, you're just so focused on the sex that you just, you deliberately ignore, you put up with all this crap just, for, just because she was like the best sex you've had up until that point in your life. And I think once you've had a lot of sexual partners, 
you've had a lot of variety sexually as a man, that loses all power over you, which I think is a good thing. Am I telling, am I saying men should all go out and, and, you know, be philandering playboys? No, but I can, but I would be lying if I said it didn't, that, that taking away the power of sex didn't make it far, didn't make my, my choices and partner far better. It didn't, it improved them dramatically. Not having the power of sex, women not being able to use the power of sex over me anymore at all. Even after we've had sex, like the, the, no matter how good it is, I will still not put up and I still will still not tolerate shitty behavior. That's a good point. So would you maybe counsel young men to get enough experience that they can sort of knock the edge off? Because men are so hypersexual. For them to even go from 100% down to 99% is a very noticeable difference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say, well, I'd say two things. I'd say date with intention. Like, have an idea. Like, understand why you are dating. Like, okay, are you just trying to get your rocks off? Or do you have a plan to act like to eventually build a family and, and you know, have a future together? Like understand your intention fund to start with. Cause then you can vet. Cause you can't, you can't vet a woman if you don't even know what kind of woman you're looking for. Uh, yeah. I do. I do think that men fundamentally need dating and relationship experience before in order to be successful or to have a lot, to have a higher chance of having a happy long-term relationship just because men are so – an inexperienced man is so easy for a woman to emotionally manipulate. Oh, yeah. So easy. Oh, yeah. Um, and and that's, that's not a, I'm not saying that like it's a bad thing either because that's women's wep- – that is, that, that, that is their weapon. That's, like men, our weapon is, is in throughout, the, throughout all of human history – the way that men have gotten what they wanted from the world was through physical force. That is our primary tool for getting what we want. And you, you look at women and, and actually children, like, well, babies, right? What, what do they use? They use manipulation. What can a baby do? A baby can do nothing except cry. So basically tug, tug on the heart. Oh, look cute. Tug on, same thing that puppies and kittens do, by the way. Like, Absolutely. It's an evolved response, but they're tugging on the heartstrings of adults. And what, what's women's primary tool for getting what they want out of the world? Well, it's, it's, it's really emotion using, and you might use the word manipulation. I'm, I, don't have a, I don't think manipulation is a dirty word, but some people have, have negative connotation for that. You might use the word persuasion or coercion or not, not coercion, but uh, persuasion. Yeah, coercion sounds even worse. That, that's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> you might use the word persuasion, but emotional persuasion, right? Or em, yeah. I would just, just emotion because they can't, they can't like steal that, you know, that a caveman goes off, bags a deer, brings it back. Lady wants a piece of it. What does she do? She can't steal it off of him. He'll just club her, right? What does she have to do? She has to use her guile. She has to use her charm. And then she gets a bit of, a bit of the, the deer meat too. And she's, she's happy and she survived. Yeah. And so it's an evolved response. So this is why inexperienced men can get taken advantage of and, 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 manipulated very very easily by women because it's like it's almost like it's their default pro i mean i think it is their default programming to use their emotions to get what they want from men and if a man doesn't isn't used isn't experienced with that doesn't know how to control that or handle that or isn't you know in some way resistant to that he will get taken advantage of i think absolutely Um, so i think a bit at least some experience in dating and relationships is necessary for a man to avoid a potentially horrible relationship. And that emotional manipulation has been wildly successful for women throughout history. So yeah. there's no reason to expect them to stop anytime soon. No, and, and it's not it's not like it's a is this isn't a moral No, yeah, problem. definitely not. You know, it's, it's just it's, it's nature. It's, it's totally it's nature. You know, it's like saying it's it's immoral for a grizzly bear to eat salmon. It's not. Mm-hmm. It's just that is, it's their nature. So we need to okay, accept their nature and work around that. Excellent. Excellent. So with this next question, sometimes in my dom sub situations, I'll notice that if I give her the full blown BDSM experience too often, it trivializes it. But mm-hmm. if I give it to her too rarely, she becomes restless and might feel unsatisfied. So I've always erred on the side of not enough rather than too much but I'm still experimenting with it. What do you think about the idea of balancing and preserving sexual novelty in a relationship? I think that's very important. It's a, you're, this is a good question. It's a really good question. 
Thank you. Because it, it doesn't, and it doesn't even have to be in a BDSM context. This applies to any sexual novelty in any relationship, right? Totally. However, novel that is, because novelty is uh, relative. Exceedingly to, relative to their previous experience with you, right? Yeah. And it's a lack of variety and novelty in the bedroom, which I think eventually leads to a dead bedroom. And men in long-term relationships tend to run into this problem with where you have the Madonna whore complex going on in a man's mind where he will, they, men lust after the whore, but they want to marry and, and wife up the Madonna. And initially, at least I think this, this kind of correlates with the honeymoon phase in relationships. I think in most initial stages of a relationship, men are, are kind of viewing their woman through the lens of the whore not to use that as a derogatory term, but just to, for this context, right? They're viewing her through the lens of the whore, so she's a sexual object. She's a muse for his lust, right? And yeah, they're less yeah. viewing her as the Madonna, the future mother of his kids or whatever. And then as the relationship, pro relationship progresses, then that switches. And he loses a bit of that, that raw lust that he had for her at the very, very beginning. And he can fall into a really repetitive consistent, predictable sexual routine, shall we say. And that might be fine for him, but it actually is not fine for her because <laughs> it takes away that excitement that she gets from being with her man. Yeah. So you've got to, you've got to keep injecting a bit of novelty and variety into your sex life or at least unpredictability. I think that's probably a better, better way of describing it because it doesn't mean you, you don't necessarily have to do completely new things all the time because then you'll, you will eventually run out. But there might, be a, there might be a few special things that are really, really exciting for both her and you and you sprinkle them in every now and then. You make them memorable you make them un and you do it unpredictably and then that allows them to have a lot more power and a lot more... Uh, importance in the overall context of the sexual relationship. So for example, one of my favorite things to do is to use uh, like the, the remote control vibrators, like a yeah. Wii or whatever. And if I do that, you know, within, you know, the, in early stages of a relationship, the first time we do it, it's a super, super exciting experience. Like we're at a restaurant, the waiter, the waitress comes over, whatever, put the Wii Vibe on, Make sure, make her like see how long she can keep a straight face while she's ordering a drink. Yes. It's just a super fun experience for both yeah. her and me. And then we get home, and she she's wanting to tear my clothes off. Great. If I did that every time we went out, it would lose all of its novelty, right? Totally. Which is surprising her with it every now and then. Every now and then keeps that novelty there and keeps that excitement there, and it's and it m maintains that that nice rhythm in the sexual relationship. Excellent answer. Excellent. Uh, and I love the remote control vibrators as well as uh, Benoit balls. Oh, I haven't played around with those. Those are the ones, those are the ones that they use, they use to like for like Kegels, right? Exactly. And when they're in a seated position, apparently it's putting pressure on their pelvic floor. And then when they rock back and forth in their seat, the balls, heck, I'm going to get this on camera. They move like this. Huh. So it rubs against her G spot. And so I'll take women to uh, like public events where I know that they have to be social with other people. Huh. And then it's sort of a test of how of, of her exhibitionist side, because I can nobody knows that. I mean, no one else notices that she's sort of rocking back and forth in her seat right. a little bit. But I notice, right? She's breathing heavier. She's sweating. <laughs> that is genius. I'm stealing that. Thank you. It, it's great. It's great. <laughs> So, so, but so but, but when she's but when when she's standing up, she's kind of got a clench to keep them in there, doesn't she? I believe so. The ones I used were very small, though, so I don't think they're going to come out without her pushing. Ah, uh, okay, right. Um, like I said, they are weirdly hard to find. Uh, the huh. ones that I've found, I had this old pair that were just they were literally just steel ball bearings. So I feel like maybe Home Depot might be the best place to go. When I go to a sex shop, they're they're too complex, they're too big, or like they're huh. made of plastic or they're hollow or something. Simplify hmm. my sex toys, please. Well, my friend here actually owns a sex shop. So if I, whenever I need something, I get I basically get it custom from him. So, <laughs> so I just I just ordered like a three thousand euro uh, like Sibian, you know, one of those things. Oh, oh, it was like like the high pat. It's like a like a chair 
which is like a like a vibrating thing attached to it with like a with like a, a control dial. And so you, nice. it's basically it's, at like a maximum speed, it sounds like a fucking rocket taking off. Uh, <laughs> but it's just it's real, and it's just it's just fun. It's just but look up Sibian and you'll see what I'm talking about. You'll get an idea. Yeah, yeah, like, I'll definitely check that out. Lots of pornography has been shot using these things. And it's one of those things where she sort of sits on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And she okay, sits on okay. it and it's like it's like a, a bit right where a clitoris goes, and then you just like turn the dial up or down depending on depending on how well she behaves. Uh, <laughs> Flawless. <laughs> can you discuss how important it is to create novel and unforgettable experiences in regards to uh imprinting yourself on the psyche of a woman well you want you ideally you want to be the best sex your woman's ever had if she's going to be with you long term you want her you, you don't the wor- a worst case scenario is she is fantasizing about a previous relationship or a previous part a previous sexual experience a previous sexual partner now you might not be the be- like you might not be the most competent uh, or capable man she's ever been with. She might have been with a guy that's richer than you, taller than you, more 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 jacked than you, um, funnier than you. Like th- this is all this is all. I mean, that's definitely the case for a lot of women I've dated before. But the thing that makes me stand out is the fact that I can give her a a sexual experience that will imprint on her psyche and. Oddly enough, one of the what, dirty, dirty talk and, and the use of words and verbiage is a really, really good way of doing that. R- like tying into like what I, what you might call like her inner slut. Oh yeah, and allowing allowing that to come out, and you being the one that kind of elicits that out of her in a non judgmental way. Allow th- th- well, then. Okay, great. Now she can explore all these things she's wanted to explore before. She, she might be, might have been curious about. You're there helping her. You'll help. You're there guiding her through the experience as well. And then on top of that, you want to dabble in the whole BDSM dom, the dom sub dynamic, which I'm which I'm a big fan of. You, there's no way you're going. Uh, uh, the average guy is going to re- have a give her a better sexual experience than the one that a dom can give her when he's sitting there denying her orgasm after orgasm after orgasm. And then, and then 20, 30 minutes later, she's exploding when you finally let her finish. Like the, just the, the, the level of compliance that is required for, for, for to get to that level, uh, the level of commitment, the level of trust that she needs to, to attach to you in, in that scenario. So there's, there's a like guys, I think the, the, the tool that kind of evens the playing field in the dating marketplace is sex for Agreed. like the, like guys who are, you know, not the richest, not the most socially connected, you know, or whatever sex is this thing, this tool, if they can, cause it's a skill like anything else. And if they have the time and the, the desire to learn it and to get into it and explore it and are, and are genuinely enthusiastic about it, which is one of, that's probably the most important thing. They have to be enthusiastic about it themselves. Well, great. Now you have this tool to make you stand out from every other guy she's ever been with. And it's obviously that's easier the less men she's been with, obviously, less, less, yeah. less uh, hypothetical competition. But yeah, I think it's important to be significant and, and you know, out, outstanding in some way to your woman because you want her to look up to her. You want her to look up to you. I couldn't agree more. And the point about being non-judgmental, I always say this apartment is not the real world. In this apartment, anything goes. And I can visibly see women like shed the mask that they wear in society. They step into this apartment and they like shed this burden of autonomy. And now they get to live out their little fantasies and they leave. I, I'm sure that most of the time they're not giving me a real name. Uh, probably a lot of them are in relationships. That was something I didn't realize when I was younger. Uh, mm. How many of the women approach me who are already in a relationship and they just want something, you know, like a one night thing on the side, something really out there, something that they wouldn't, may, they would maybe feel like they're going to be judged if they bring this idea to their boyfriend. Yep. And so. But unfortunately, as I've gotten older, the word boyfriend has become husband. So it's become, it's become a lot sketchier. <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate. <laughs> well, I mean, thankfully, they don't tell me anymore. But I, I wouldn't want to know either way. Yeah, I, I would much rather not know in that scenario. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. But you're right. The, the being non-judgmental is actually one of the easiest ways for men to get casual sex. Oddly enough, like it's, it, it, to, I, I figured that out a long time ago, and it was I, I would. This is back in the days when I was like going to bars and clubs with friends of mine. We we hit on girls and stuff, and I'd see one like one of my friends was a bit prudish, and I guess he he was very very sexually conservative himself, right? And so he, that would, and that would just come across in his interactions with women and the way, and the way he would talk about sex. If that's, if that ever came up in conversation, it was really obvious, like the way that women responded to that versus like me coming in and being totally non-judgmental about sex, not necessarily like talking about it off rip, but when the conversation eventually led down a sexual path, she could tell that she could say anything to me and it wouldn't freak me out, weird me out. I'm like, whatever cool exactly yeah totally. and and that that allows her to open up a lot that creates that it creates that trust allows her to open up and you get to like i said before that you get to see that in a slot of hers come out and blossom with you and then it can attach itself to you like that as well so to build off of your point that you made earlier about teaching men i completely agree that you can teach men how a woman's mind works and how to manipulate sexual tension and sexual fragility these things are definitely teachable what i what i don't do though when i talk to men is um i would never recommend a man to become a dom if he is not already predisposed to that type of personality and lifestyle i think it would be exposing subs to unnecessary danger because it is you know, what we're doing is simulated danger but yeah. If you put that in the hands of a fool, it becomes real danger. Now, I don't when I don't necessarily tell guys to get into like the scene as a dom. Uh, what I do encourage guys to do, though, because I mean, because that's 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 primarily what you're taught, like the reference you're making there. I I, I, should, I would assume that's what it sounds yes, like to me. Yes, yeah, sir. And yeah. but I but I encourage them to tap into the more like to, at least into dominant sexuality. Now that and that and they have to play around within their own comfort zone as a man, because that's actually more important because she's like, if I'm not comfortable doing this, she sure as hell ain't going to be comfortable with me doing it to her. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually the man's level of comfort and competence. It is actually paramount in terms of introducing anything kinky or new or potentially, you know, uh, mm. risk risk or that has might have a bit of risk involved in it that has to be executed in a correct way with correct technique so his level of confidence and and comfort and competence is actually paramount in that situation so that's that when it comes to doing the more a lot more actual dom stuff in the lifestyle which is very technical i completely agree with you there if you're not in if you're not inclined to look after your your submissive to be to be responsible for her, for her well-being or yeah, extreme then you, consideration then, yeah then you shouldn't be going down that path yeah um but it, but it has to that to start somewhere like every guy has to yeah. everyone guy got into that at some point somewhere by being curious about it at least but what i will try to encourage guys to do is though is to tap into like their more the more dominant side of their sexuality now that doesn't mean necessarily tying her up doesn't necessarily mean you know uh, uh, strapping into a, to a bench, strapping to a machines, using floggers and chains and whips and things like this. It can, for a guy who's very vanilla, it can be. It could just be as simple as like physically manhandling her and moving around between positions. It could yeah. start as simple as that. A blindfold, something that's very very easy for a vanilla guy or an inexperienced guy to get comfortable doing just to open himself up to the, to the, to that side of his sexuality, because I think women are craving it so much. They're craving it more and more these days when now that women are in more masculine roles in the, especially in the workforce and in society, well, that, that creates a vacuum where they need their, to be in their feminine more in the bedroom. They need to be more in their submissive side in the bedroom than ever before. And, when they come across a guy who isn't in his masculine polarity, who isn't being more dominant and passionate in that regard, well then 
she loses all interest for him and she's not, in, she's not interested in seeing him ever again. I've had, I've had guys come to me like that, like girls used to ghost me and now I've started switching things up a little bit, taking, taking more of a lead, taking charge in the bedroom, being a little bit more physical, and obviously in a consensual, safe way, but being a bit more physical. Oh, miraculously, the women want to see me again and again. They're calling me up. When can I see you again? Like, and again, it goes, it, it's totally got to do with how comfortable he is with doing things, but that's what I try to teach guys is like, okay, like, he, if you want to, ch- to learn how to choke a girl, okay, well, here's the correct way to choke a girl, sexually, consensually. And here's even more importantly, here's how to test to see if she even wants you to choke her. Like, look yeah, for the body it. language. Look for the, can you, get, can you read her body? If you just put your hand on a, on a, like a collarbone here, what is her body language telling you? You haven't even done anything yet, but there's the potential for it, and she can tell that. So she's going to give you some kind of a, a positive signal or some kind of a negative signal. Like, is she tensing up and is, like, looking freaked out? Okay, cool. We don't go there anymore. <laughs> like, we know that's a no-go zone, right? Yeah. Or, is she, or is she grabbing your hand and trying to shove it into her own throat? That might be a green light. <laughs> <laughs> this is real emotional intelligence. When women talk about emotional intelligence, a man reading a woman's v- bodily cues and and understanding her vibe and then – him having an energy that she can reflect a positive, comfortable energy. Yeah. Cause what yeah. you feel, they feel it's certainly. in the bedroom. A hundred percent. If you're, if you come into the bedroom with nervous, anxious energy, she's going to feel nervous and anxious around you. If you come, if you're coming into the bedroom, very confident and feeling sexy and calm and it's like a calm arousal. Well, bang, that's exactly the kind of energy she's going to pick up on. That's what she's going to feel. And that's what you want her to feel. You want her to feel calm and aroused. Absolutely. So to build off subs and doms again, (laughs) uh, sometimes I'll ask my subs after the encounter, uh, I'll say something because I'm just curious about, I'm trying to get into their headspace. I'll say something along the lines of, when did you know that you would submit to me and sleep with me? (laughs) And strangely often they'll tell me, oh, I knew you were a dom immediately and I decided I would submit to you as soon as we got into each other's personal space. Hmm. Uh, I don't generally advertise that I'm a dom, uh, yet submissive women have sought me out all over the world. So my question to you, if you have this wisdom to share with me, how the fuck do they know I'm a dom without, <laughs> without interacting with me? It surprises me every time. You know what? I get the exact same kind of answers. I get the exact same kind of responses. Like, I, like again, either I've... Women I've only ever talked to like online like this, kind of in a Zoom context. Women I've only ever talked to on Instagram or if it's a first date, I'll get a very, very similar uh, kind of statement, which is like, yeah, like you're, you're obviously the more dominant type. Doesn't yeah, it, it, necessarily, it, they don't necessarily call me a dom because was, we're not in like a lifestyle context or anything like that. Gotcha. But they, they identify that how, I guess I have what you might call dominant energy or whatever the hell. And... You know, maybe, maybe it's, again, I'm not a, not a woman, so it's, it's hard for me to, to put my, myself into their shoes in this context, but maybe it's all the little subtle things that you do. Maybe it's your, you opening the door for her, pulling her chair out for her at the dinner table, ordering a drink for her, uh, telling her when and where to meet you, like meet me at, eight, at this bar at 8 p.m., wear this. Yeah. Like all these subtle like indicators before you've even met her tell her a lot about your demeanor and your personality and whether you're the kind of guy who, who is comfortable just taking charge versus the guy who is more inclined to uh, look for her input on everything. Gotcha. I, I like that answer. I like that. Yeah. I can't tell you. I, I can't tell you if it's, yeah, so just a, a magical woo woo energy in the air. I, I don't think it's that. I think it's a lot more of these yeah. like, uh, yeah. Cause women yeah. are amazing at reading up on, at, at picking up on exactly. something. That's how they navigate life. They pick up on all these micro cues from guys to determine like what, okay, is this guy really what he says he is? You know? Yeah. And it's, and women will complain about guys who talk a big talk and then can't back it up face to face. So yeah, like, I hear that all the time. They complain about that. Right. Like guy, the guy who will talk a big talk through text. Oh, I'm going to do all these kind of crazy, amazing thing, things to you, blah, 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 blah. And then she meets him in person and he's like timid. Dead. super timid, doesn't know what he's doing, uh, can't, yeah. can't lead the interaction. And it's like, oh, okay, well, this guy's a big letdown. 
you know, I've heard this from women before. So it's got to be, it's got to be in the subtleties. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. Women are exceptional at picking up on, on uh, the nuances. Here's another question I've struggled with for years that I've been batting around in my head. A lot of the dom sub lifestyle entails an experience that I'm providing for my sub. While at the same time, when I'm really deep in the dom space mentality, in a strange sense, I'm almost alone. Like she stops being a person with a name and she like transcends her physical form. She becomes a symbol of lust. She becomes an avatar mm. of sexuality, a mm. vehicle for my amusement. So my question to you, in your opinion, is being a dom an act that's centered in selfishness or selflessness? Ooh, that's a very good question. Damn. Hmm. I think it has to be selfless because you purely because you you need the other person to do it. You have you as in as in you need to be giving energy to someone else for you to even get into that dominant headspace, and they have to be willing and a willing recipient of it, and and a a grateful happy joyful recipient of that enthusiastic so, enthusiastic i don't know any any guy on the planet who's, who would call himself a dom who can enjoy who can get into that if his partner is not enjoying what's going on dead right she might even, like she might be she might be feigning uh disenjoyment she might be playing a yeah. character or getting into a role but when the character breaks when the when the role's over she is thoroughly enjoy thoroughly enjoyed herself and she's thoroughly enjoying the moment um have, have many instances of instances of that on on set for kink.com where it's a case of like she has to pretend like like the director would stop the girl like stop smiling you're supposed to be black you're, he's blackmailing you right now you're supposed to be like <laughs> not happy that this is happening she's like yeah but i just i just love being whipped so much <laughs> so, many instances like that on set which is very very funny but but that that tells you like a lot about that scenario, I think. Yeah, so I, I think it's it's really more of a selfless act because yeah, you're the you're the one creating an experience for her. Her, you're the one doing an experience for her, and yeah, you get uh, you as as the dominant get your you know a, a a spark. You get that fire. You get that lust from putting her into that scenario, putting her putting her into her subspace that allows you to get into into your your more dominant self. Your more that that, that muse. But that's still a, it's you're doing something for someone else first. It's it's the same it's the same way that uh, but when you donate to charity, you feel good about yourself. It's inherently a selfless act. If I if I if I you know go pay a friend's hospital bill, of course I'm gonna feel I feel amazing about myself. But I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing it because I care about that person and I'm trying to help them. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I think fundamentally, the act of being a dominant is a selfless one. I, I totally agree with that. Um, I think it's easy to see it either way. Uh, a sub of mine asked me a little while ago, she was like, what are you thinking about when you're in the dom space? Because um, we had just had like a very intense encounter. And she was like, what were you thinking about? I was like, I'm never thinking about how to be a dom. That comes naturally. All of my conscious thought is how to keep you safe. <laughs> like women are so fragile right. like all of my conscious thought is like okay how do i do this is are those too tight how do i manipulate her arm i don't want to hurt her wrist all right. these things is she, she gonna she fall thinks, is she gonna fall off this thing like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, she's tied up she can't break her fall if she falls off the bed yep. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh okay so to build off of that a weird experience i've had is that oftentimes my selfishness will sometimes be misconstrued as altruism and i'll give you an example and, and i want to ask you if you ever have any situations like this i refuse to lie to women and women will misconstrue that as altruism They're like, oh you're a great guy it's selfish lying is effort i just don't love you enough to lie to you i'm happy to lie to my grandma if she's like what'd you do this weekend i'm gonna be like i saw a movie i'm not gonna say i had this nigerian girl tied up all weekend I'm going to be like, oh, I'm going to lie to my grandma. But some girl I just met on a dating app, I'm not going to lie to her. I, I, it's not worth the effort. Hmm. So do you ever have instances where selfishness is misconstrued as altruism? That's interesting. Well, I'm funny that they, they misconstrue it as altruism. 
as well. More than just like, more than just uh, like honesty and kind, I guess like directness. Like they view, it as, they view it as you actually doing something for them. Yeah, exactly. They, huh. They're like, oh, he's a great guy. You know, he, he tells me the truth about X, Y, Z. It's like, you, you're just not worth lying to. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, I can't say I've had that exact experience where they've, yeah, where they've considered it older. Probably because most of the time when I'm being brutally honest, I'm, I'm probably in a bad mood. <laughs> and so I'm just, I'm telling it like, I'm telling them how it is. And f- a few minutes later, they're crying or something. So and it's, it's like, you know, if I'm in a, if I'm, if I'm in a bad, if something, if, if a woman's done something to irritate me and she comes over and says like, Oh, she notices, she notices I'm a bit quiet. I'm just like, are you okay? And instead of lying and saying, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just saying, well, you you fucking pissed me off tonight. We did this, 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 like, and then, you know, then she starts crying. I'm like, oh, God damn it. So I don't get the altruism uh, side of things. No, I get that you're, you're a dickhead. So I get the completely opposite reaction half the time. Well, I do, that, I do that brutal honesty from the first date. And so I filter out all the women who either ask salacious questions or mm. who have thin skins. That's a good, you know, that's a good thing. To, that's actually a very, very good thing to filter out, the, the thin skinned women. <laughs> Well, some women, when they, if you tell them that you're not going to lie to them, they take it as a challenge. Like, oh, I'm going to ask the craziest question I can think of. And then <laughs> I have a lot of women just stand up and walk away on the first date, like in the middle of the meal, just stand up and walk away because I said some wild shit. You shouldn't be asking dangerous questions if you don't want dangerous answers. That's a good, that's, you know, that's going to be a, that's a lesson in, uh, in humility for them, I think. Yeah. That's oh. yeah. They're not going to forget that one. <laughs> So if I you, did you, you had a billion questions, I'm happy to do this again sometime because this, this has been a fantastic chat. I'm just going to make sure I get uh, Excellent. Uh, yeah, I've got a bunch of questions, so anytime. Save them. Um, so I do the DiCaprio treatment. I set my dating apps to a maximum of 24. <laughs> but I've noticed that a minority, a significant minority of younger women today, they seem to have a very unrealistic conceptualization of consent and sexuality an almost clinical job interview like process where every conceivable scenario should be discussed and negotiated at length before, during and after the encounter. Right. Due to the fact that all human interaction has some margin of error where we, have, where we have to allow people to make mistakes. My question to you is, do you think that these young people can have a sexy, a healthy sex life? Not like that. They can't not when you need to fill out like, <laughs> uh, you know, like a health and safety application form every time you want to get into the bedroom with somebody. Uh, yeah, for real. I mean, think about it. Like, our, we, humans have been on the planet for how many thousands of years, and we've managed to we've managed to reproduce and have very, very happy, loving families and loving consensual sexual relationships for eons without the need for a consent form mm-hmm. and without the need to sit down and go over like every single little possible scenario. It's funny because that's that's actually exactly what we would have to do on set for pornography. Is you'd go down a in particular, definitely for like more, you know, like BDSM scenes, but even for some, some regular scenes, we'd have a, 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 a consent checklist of all the things that we could do to one another and all the things we couldn't do. And then all the words we could say and the words we couldn't say to that person. And it was just this, bam, 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 bam. we'd fill that out. M- me and her would fill it out beforehand and, we, and then we'd swap notes and we'd look over each other's stuff. And it, for her, it was easy because she's like, ah, whatever. She ain't gonna, not like she's really going to do anything to me that I can't stop her from doing anyway. But I'm yeah. like sitting here, like I'm trying to memorize this list. I'm like, okay, don't, don't call her that. Don't call her that. Do this. Don't do this. Okay, got it. Like, mm-hmm. Trying to like memorize that before we get started fucking. And nothing, in my opinion, nothing destroys sexual tension more than that level of predictability. Yeah. Because sexual tension, so you can't have a, I don't think, this, you know, women or, or even men who adopt that kind of attitude towards sex, like you mentioned before, where every single possible hypothetical scenario has to be discussed in advance and every, every little box has to be checked and we have to consent to absolutely everything because it takes away any mystery. It takes away any uh, unpredictability. And sexual tension is fundamentally about unpredictability. That's what, it's, that's what sexual tension is, you know? Even even if somebody is sitting there sexting you all day, telling them what they're going to do to you, 
there's still the anticipation in your mind of what it, of exactly what it's going to be like. Even though you think you know what their plan is, it's like, is it going to be as good as they say it is? Is it not? I wonder how she's going to suck my dick. I wonder how she's going to spread her ass cheeks. All these things are going through your head. So there's still even a degree of unpredictability there, but it's the unknown that makes it fun. It's the unknown that makes that, makes that sexual tension in the first place, especially yeah. for women, even yes. more so for, for women than for men, because they need that, 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 that excitement in their mm-hmm. sex life to make it something that they want to come back for more and more and more and again and again and again. They want their man to give them that exciting experience. And I honestly don't think that women are going to have anywhere near as exciting and fulfilling sexual experiences when they come at it from that attitude that you mentioned before. I couldn't agree more. I, I couldn't agree more. Well, we'll do one last one. I heard you mention a word that I'd never heard before. Uh, was it uh, cucketing, cucketing, coquetting, coquetting. Yeah. So you described it as a. Sexual yeah, there was two. Push there was two pull. words that could have come out of your mouth just then that, yeah. that I was thinking you were going to say. One was coquetting, and the other was cuckweening. That was the oh, other. I've never heard of cuckweening. I can go into both. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so I heard you describe cucketing as a, a sexual push and pull. This yeah. is one of those Jordan Peterson moments where you summarize that so perfectly. This is the cornerstone of what I do in my dom sub engagements is manipulating sexual tension, manipulating sexual fragility, making her, you know, what I like to say is I build her out of glass so that I can shatter her. Huh. Right. And what I, what I call it is preservation of touch, since I'd never heard the word cucketing before. But uh, <laughs> preservation of touch makes it sound like a, it's a physics principle. <laughs> it does a bit. <laughs> yeah. but well, it's, co- uh, it, coquetting it, comes from the word a coquette. I mean, if you, you probably never heard that expression before, but that's like no. old school Victorian English. Like, oh, she was a coquette, which means basically meant she was a bit of a cock tease. That's what it really gotcha. meant. Uh, can, you, un- can you discuss some underlying theory uh, about the, the concept of building sexual sensitivity, manipulating her sexual tension, uh, steering her through the emotional landscape to eventually arrive at the geographic location called <laughs> orgasm in her mind. <laughs> I love the way you describe things, bro. You're, you're really good at this. Uh, yeah. So you always said coquetting it's sexualized push pull. And, and the best example I you could you could give is thinking about what a stripper does to you when you're in a strip club, right? So she's going to grind her, her her butt up on your crotch. She's going to shove her titties in your face, and then the moment you try to touch her on the leg, she slaps your hand away and says you can't do that. So it's like ramping you up on one side and then denying you on the other side, and that that plays in very very easily into uh, you know to BDSM into dom sub uh, situations. One of the things that I've done in the past you know, in a BDSM context is, uh, you know, you could, you could, you could hold up, let's say, let's say, let's say I've strapped my lovely lady down to this, this bench I've got over here. One, in one hand, I've got the flogger and the other hand, I've got her touchy wand. And you might, you might say to her, okay, baby, do you want, do you want pain or do you want pleasure? And she's always, they basically always go, Hitachi. They always, they always want the pleasure. Well, the only, the only way in life you could ever get pleasure is by going through pain first. <laughs> and so you have to make a matter. But it's, this, it's, it's a very, very similar principle of like denial, right? Building up, that, building up that excitement, building up that sexual tension, almost giving her what she wants and then taking it away so that we can start that process again and build it up even more and then take it away again. Because it's, that, it's, the, it's in the takeaway. It's in the denial of letting her say finish an, or- an orgasm 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 denial is a great example of this as well mm-hmm. so you're not you're not allowed to come until i tell you to come yeah. and then i mean for me one of my favorite ways of punishing that if she does happen to like so right at the beginning she knows that if if you're not going to come with that daddy's permission are you no daddy i'm not going to come cool if she happens to slip an orgasm out well then she's getting spanks on the clitoris either with my bare hand or with the, or I take the flogger to her clitoris or whatever so that she know you know, she knows that there's, there's ramifications for this money. And it's, a, and it's obviously done in a fun consensual way. Of course. But that the denial and the taking away, particularly with say, with say orgasm denial just makes the next one even more intense. That, that yeah. consistent buildup 
it's like it's an exponential effect. Just they just stack on top of one another until she just can't control herself, and it's it's one of the most intense orgasmic experiences you can give a woman. So that's why I'm a, I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. Uh, what else did we talk about there? We talked about uh, yeah the, the deni- denial in terms of even denial in terms of being able to please you. So you can deny a girl from sucking your dick as well. Yeah. Like she, oh, please, daddy, please, daddy, please let me suck your dick or whatever. She, she might be in that really, really submissive space where she just, is just craving being a pleaser like that and flipping the script on that and then denying her the ability to do that and then making her, making her do something first. One of, my, one of my favorite phrases is, what are you going to do for me? Because that'll get women into a lot of trouble. <laughs> what, <laughs> what are you going to do for me? You know? If you, if you make a woman say, uh, uh, you know, if you deny her an orgasm and then you, you say, uh, um, or, she, or she starts begging to, to, to orgasm, that's a great opportunity to, to slip in, well, what are you going to do for me then? The worst thing she could possibly say is anything you want. That is, <laughs> that is basically her writing you a blank check and she doesn't know what she's just done. So oh, yeah. that, that's a very, very fun game to play there as well. But it's all, it's, I, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm a bit twisted in the head, but I like these kind of I love uh, it. escalation and denial kind of games. Uh, yeah. And I think, I think that, that, that from the Dom perspective, they're incredibly fun. It, it really gets you involved. It's, it's, it's kind of like, it takes the work away. It takes the work yes. out, of, out of being a Dom and, doing, and delivering her an experience because it makes it fun for both of you. And, and she gets the, the a fantastic experience as a result anyway. But yeah, uh, yeah I think it's, it's less performative and it's more in, in, enjoyable and, and uh, engaging for both of us. One of my favorite things in the world is getting a sub and, and watching her melt down psychologically from who she walked in as you know, she's this person, she's got a social security number, she pays taxes, blah, 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 like her cat is sick. And then 30 minutes, an hour, I, I, I'm, I, I get pretty ruthless with the te- teasing and edging. After a little while, she's just reduced to like, a, she's an animal, like pure lizard brain, yeah. you know, and watching that process of her, like she's losing layer after layer of her reason and her rationale. And then by the time I untire, like you said, all the hard work's been done already, and you've you she's you got a blank check, whatever you want. But that's that that's an unforgettable experience you've just given her. Think about how, like people people go him go into the Himalayan mountains and become a monk, spend their dedicate their entire life to meditation to achieve <laughs> the same level of lack of consciousness that you were able to give a woman within like sixty minutes just by playing these kinds of like denial games with yeah. her sexually. That's a, yeah. that's an experience that she probably doesn't, she probably doesn't appreciate enough how special that truly is. Pro- yeah, probably not. Probably not The you gotta be a master of almost enough, a master of almost. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. Anyway, Sterling, thank you so much for taking the time today. This has been a great interview. I've really enjoyed talking to you. This was and, awesome. Uh, it was my pleasure. My pleasure, mate. Please uh, take the moment to uh, let the audience know where they can reach you and uh, what they can uh, what they can expect. Yeah. Well, they can expect uh, part two because we'll definitely do this again. You have Absolutely. you had a bunch of questions right. still still uh, to, to line up, so we'll, we'll definitely get back into it. Uh, SterlingCooper.com. Sterling spelt where am I? With my finger, like my uh, my name over here. Dot com. That's where you can go to find all my my books, my video courses. I touch on uh, multiple different topics, like from premature ejaculation to performance anxiety. We talk about you know how to, how to please a woman sexually through you know angles and and dirty talk and psychology and all the things we just talked about. So I touch on all those topics. Uh, my YouTube channel, ton of free resources there. I go in, I give away a ton of free advice on that on all these topics. Uh, as well. So YouTube channel is a very, very good place to go find that. And then if you want to f- hear my ramblings and musings, uh, my Twitter is a great place to go check out. I'm at Sterling Wisdom on Twitter and on Instagram for the time being, I'm at Cooper Sterling. And you can just see a little bit of behind the scenes of my, my day-to-day life from there, I guess. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you again, man. My pleasure. Well, if you enjoyed that video, 
give it a thumbs up and subscribe down below and hit that bell icon so you don't miss any content. If you want to support the channel, the link to the Patreon is in the description where you can offer general support for what I do here or you can hire me for one-on-one -on -one coaching.